Welcome to the Tables Participation Project video for the WV Mining problem. Here I've downloaded and extracted the data files and I've opened up the starter file that's provided. For most participation projects this semester, there will be a starter file. It's often going to be identical to the end result of the previous participation project. In this case, there's a couple minor differences uh, just with some of the sheets. But it's important that even if you complete the previous project, you still go and use the starter file that we provide rather than continuing to work on the previous file. If you continue to use the previous file, what will likely happen is that you will not get credit for the assignment because there are properties that we embed in each of the starter files that allows us to keep track of which projects you submit. So if you reuse an earlier file, it's not going to have the expected properties and you're not going to get credit for that file. So if there's a starter file, make sure you use it to complete the project. Let's go ahead and get started with the project. Today we're going to take a look at how you can use and format tables, which are a feature that Excel provides to make it easier to go through and do some data analysis and data management. You can tell if you have a table in Excel because if you click in a cell, you'll see a table design ribbon. If I'm not clicked inside of a table, that ribbon goes away. Tables are also normally going to have some sort of visual formatting, like you can kind of see the different shades of green here. That's going to also kind of give it away that it's a table. Although, strictly speaking, you can apply these formatting options without being in the table. We're going to start off the project here by going and applying some formatting settings to this table here on the coal mine sheet. So right now this table has the standard formatting that was selected by Excel itself when we went and imported the XML file. We want to go and change the style of this table. There's two ways we can go and do that. One of them is by going to the table design ribbon and we can use the table styles selector here. Or on the home ribbon whether it says format as table, we can also select a style there. I'm going to go ahead and change this, and I can pick anything other than the default one. I'm going to go ahead with this blue with gray lines. You can see that even without me selecting the entire table, since I was already inside the table, it just went and changed the color. It figured that, okay, he wants to go and change the style of the entire table that he's inside of. For the next step, we need to insert three new table columns to the right of existing column G. Before we go and do that, I want to talk a little bit about what the difference is between the different types of columns and, and by extension rows inside of Excel. And to help do that, I'm going to insert some values inside my sheet that are not part of the table. In G1, I'll type in 1, 2, 3, and in I4, I'm going to type in 4, 5, 6. And I'll go back to G1, and on the home ribbon, I'm going to go to Insert. I'll choose a little drop down here and say that I want to insert a sheet column. When I go and insert a sheet column, it's basically going to go all the way through my sheet and just take the existing column and shove it to the right. So what had been cell G1 now becomes H1. And it does that all throughout the sheet, including in tables. So in my table here, it actually created a new column. And Excel tried to go through and extrapolate what an appropriate column label would be. Didn't quite pick up the pattern that I'm going every five years here, but it at least did figure out that we had 2014 and 2015 should come after that. So it at least grabbed that part. But you can see anything that is both inside the table or outside the table got relocated to the right. I'm going to go ahead and undo this change because I want to show you the other type of column that we can insert. To insert a table column, we actually need to be clicked in a cell that is part of the table. When we are and we go to the insert menu, we're going to see this insert table columns option up here. And you're always going to have the one to insert table columns to the left. 
Inserting table columns to the right is only going to be available if you are clicked into the rightmost column of the existing table. I'm going to go ahead and insert a table column to the left here. You can see that it inserted a new column in the table, so it still has this new column here and it gave that same 2015 heading. It shoved everything in the table and to the right of the table, to the right. So what had been G4 now became H4. This value that was outside of the table but to the right of the table that had been in I4 is now in J4. But if you notice, what we had in G1 is still in G1. Anything that is above or below the table doesn't get moved. So that's kind of an important distinction just to be aware of when you go and create new columns, depending on what you're trying to do. Maybe you want to go with a sheet column, and in fact I can actually still insert sheet columns when I'm inside of the table. Um, but a lot of times if we're working with the table, we probably just want to insert table columns instead. So I'm going to undo that change, and I'm actually going to delete these values because we don't need them going forward. We're going to go ahead and insert those table columns, and we want them to be to the right of existing column G, which is our rightmost column. So I've clicked in the heading, but I can just as well click in the cell, it doesn't really matter. I can go to the insert menu, or I can also right click and go to insert, and I'm going to tell it here I want to do a table column to the right. And I'm going to do this until we have three new columns. Next, we want to adjust some of the options for our table. So when we're clicked inside a cell in the table, we want to go to the table design ribbon. And under table style options, we're going to check two boxes here. We're going to turn on first column. And this one's just a formatting style thing. You can see here, column A gets a different visual appearance that kind of makes it stand out when we check the first column box. We're also going to check the total row box. And that's going to insert a new row at the very bottom of our table. And we'll use this a little bit later to go and compute some statistics about the values that are in the different columns in the table. We're going to finish things out for now with this sheet by going and typing in values that are listed down in the instructions. We're going to start off by giving headings for these new columns that we created. So in H3, I'm going to type in PCTG, abbreviation for percentage, of total mind. I'll tab over to I3, which is going to be 2019 top 10 county, and J3 is 1999 plus top 10 county. And then we're going to go below that total row we just added down to cell A60. We'll type in minimum. I'll hit enter and go down to A61. We'll do maximum, average, median, and correlation. And that's all we need to do on this sheet for right now. So I'm going to go ahead and save my changes. Next, we want to head over to the prices sheet. Now, for those of you who did the Excel Basics Participation Project, which was done in the current version of Excel for Windows, this was actually a table. With current versions of Excel for Windows, when you import from a CSV file, one of the options is to bring it in as a table, just like what happened with our XML file here on the coal mine sheet. That's a change from how things used to work. In older versions of Excel for Windows, and in Excel for Mac as of the day that I'm recording this video. When you import a CSV file, it just brings in the values. It doesn't apply any formatting. We can still make this be a table though, and that's what we're going to go ahead and do here. In the instructions, it says that for cells A3 through K58, we want to go and make them a table using a style of our choice. So I'm clicked in A3, which is going to be our top left corner. And then I'll hold down the shift key and click in K58, which will be the bottom right corner. And you can see we've basically highlighted this table type range. And we're going to create a table of our choice. So on the home ribbon, I want to go to format as table, and I'm going to pick a different style. Um, 
than just for visual sake here so I can more easily differentiate between sheets. I'm going to go with this orange with gray stripes rather than the blue with gray stripes we did earlier. When you go and select the style, you're going to get this format as table dialog. It's going to ask you where the data is for your table and it'll pre-populate this with the range of cells that you have selected. There's also going to be this checkbox that says my table has headers and you want to pay attention to this one. If you have a case where your first row is basically column headings which is what we have here we want to check this box because that's going to tell Excel that those in fact should be column headings. If this box is unchecked Excel is going to figure that's just data and it'll make a new row it'll insert above there and it'll just name things like column 1, column 2. Most of the time you're not going to want that. Generally speaking you know, when you bring in CSV data, you're going to have a heading there, although not always. Um, but for our projects, we pretty much always have headings there. Uh, so we want to make sure that this My Table Has Headers box is checked. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And you can see this has now become part of a table. We want to insert one new table column to the right of existing column K. So I'll click in column K inside the table. And then I'm going to go uh, right click, go to insert, and then go to table column to the right. And in this new cell L3 that was just added, I'm going to type in cold pricing. And I'll go ahead and save my changes here as well. The only thing that we're going to do on the total value sheet right now is go and create a table. And it has the same range A3 through K58. I'm going to select cells just a different way just to give you some options on how you can do this. If you click in this little box here, that's going to be where you can type in a specific cell that you want to go to. So I can type in like A3, or you can actually type in a range of cells to select them. So if I type in A3 and then a colon K58, it's going to select that range of cells. So if you have a whole bunch of cells to select and you know what the defined boundaries of are for your range, you can just type it in and Excel will select it for you. We're going to make this one be a table as well. So on the home ribbon, I'll go to format as table and I'll just keep working my way through. We'll do this one that has gray with gray stripes. Now this time, Excel did not mark that this has headers by default. It tries to look and guess. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. We definitely have headers though. We've got data going across. So I'm going to make sure I have that box checked and I'll click OK. On the forecast sheet we already have a table because this is what was automatically created when we imported from the access database. But we do want to tweak things a little bit. The color is fine as it is. We just want to make sure that we turn on the total row. So on the table design ribbon when I'm clicked inside the table I'm just going to check the box that says total row. We're going to use these total rows that we've added to go and compute some statistics. We'll start over on the coal mine sheet. I'm going to scroll to the bottom where we have the total row. And the instructions say that I want to find the sum for columns C through G. So if I click in column C, and if I'm clicked outside of the table, I'll see the column heading. When I'm clicked in the table, I'll see just the actual uh, text that is associated with that heading. But I'm going to go ahead and click in C59 which is the total row for column C. And you'll notice there's this little drop down arrow beside the cell. That's going to allow me to choose a statistical measure that I want to use. We want to sum the values, so I'll choose sum. And I'm going to keep on doing that over until column G, which is the value for the year 2019. So what this is doing here is adding up how much coal was mined in each of these years. On the coal mine sheet here, the instructions say I should not display any statistics in columns H through J. So H and I are empty. J has a value. When you go and add a total row, Excel by default will always do something with the rightmost column in that table. So here it went and selected count, but there's no values that are actually inside of that column. 
in the table, so there's nothing for it to count. We want to get rid of this. And there's two ways we can do it. From the drop-down list, we can just choose none. Or if I undo that, the other way to get rid of this is just to hit the delete key on the keyboard. That'll also get rid of the value that's displayed there. Let's go ahead over to the forecast sheet and we're going to set up some statistics here as well. We want to find the sum for columns B through G and column I. So you can see B through G is 1999 tons through 2024 tons and then the total coal value for 2024. So let's we'll go ahead and set these And this last one was count, but we're going to change it to sum. And it says we don't want to display anything in column H, and there is nothing there. So we're good at that step. Let's go ahead back over to our coal mine sheet. And you can see right now there's not really much of a pattern about the order in which our counties are listed. The instructions tell us that we want to sort the data by county in ascending order. And there's actually a couple different ways we can go and do this. The easiest way is to take advantage of this drop down that's in the heading because we're in a table. If you click on the drop down arrow, you can see that it'll sort in A to Z order, which is ascending, or Z to A, which is descending. I'm just going to tell it that I want to sort A to Z. And it's going to go and sort these values, and then the associated data off to the right it's going to go through and move around so that it stays with the correct county. Let's go ahead and save our changes here. The last part of this project are what we call the analysis questions. These are things that you'll see in some participation projects and on every homework and exam. With the analysis questions, we're asking you to go and look at the data that you worked with as part of that project to go and try to make some reasoned decisions. Some cases there may be an objective right or wrong answer. In other cases the question might be subjective. But what we're trying to see here is your thought process. So you want to make sure that you don't just give a yes or no answer to these. You should always have, you know, even if it is a yes or no type question, explain yes and here's why or no and here's why. We, you know, we want to go through and see why you're saying what you're saying, not just strictly speaking what you believe the answer is. Sometimes with these questions here, it's going to be pretty obvious from the data. Some questions might rely on a little bit of common sense knowledge or maybe just a little bit of thinking the issue over. Sometimes, at least if you're working on a homework or participation project, a little bit of Googling might help as well. Let's go ahead over to the analysis question sheet. And this is going to be where we'll answer these questions one to a row. We're going to do our first question in row two. In cell A2, we'll type in that this is question 10A. And in cell B2, we're going to type in our answer. Now in a later participation project, we're going to apply some more formatting that will make these a little bit easier to read. But right now, we just want to give our text. And normally we're looking for an answer between two and three sentences for most questions. This question states, uh, how does the amount of coal mined in Montegalia County, which is where Morgantown is located, uh, in 2019 compare with other counties in the state? Why might Montegalia County produce more coal than many counties in the traditional coal fields of southern and southwestern West Virginia? So let's go take a look at our data on the coal mine sheet. And we can see here in 2019, that Montegalia County had about four and a half uh, million tons of coal mined. And let's take a look in particular, um, we'll just kind of scroll through. It's definitely one of the larger numbers that we can see here. So like here, Randolph County is about 1.1 million tons. Uh, Taylor's about the same as Montegalia County, that's the next county south. We have uh, some counties here like this, Webster County in the central part of the states, 
about half a million tons. Wetzel County's actually got uh, quite a bit of coal now after not having a number for a long time here. But let's really kind of focus on southern and southwestern West Virginia. So Wyoming County, which has long produced a good amount of coal, um, right now is actually below Monongalia. Uh, it had about three and a half million tons. Mingo's a little bit above Monongalia right now, but it had been below in 2014. McDowell is less. McDowell at one point was the leading producer in the state. It's down to about 3.8 million tons. Marshall County in the northern panhandle is the highest number. It has 18 million tons. So if we go and kind of look through here, um, you know, a lot of counties don't produce any coal at all. But West Montegalia County is kind of in the middle of the pack uh, and maybe towards the upper end of the coal producing counties. So that kind of answers the first question. Um, you know, it, how does the amount in Mon County compare with other counties of the state? At least for coal producing counties, Monongalia is, you know, upper middle of the pack. Uh, and then the second part of the question here was why might there be more coal than traditional coal fields of southern and southwestern West Virginia? If you go through and take a look at some of these other counties, that are in the southern and southwestern parts of the state, you can see their numbers have fallen. Boone County had 30 million tons in 1999 and 4.2 in 2019. If we go and look at some of these other counties here, you know, Mingo was almost 20 million, 21 million tons, down to five. McDowell's been kind of stable. Wyoming's fallen off from about 10 million tons to about three and a half. And actually, if you go back and look at years previous to this, the fall off in production from the coal fields is much more sharp. Um, just focusing on the last 20 years, it's not quite as obvious. What sort of reason might there be for that? Well, one thing that you got to think about when you're going and mining coal is that there's cost to mine coal. There's a lot of labor associated with it. You need to go through and uh, do a lot of prep work, whether you know, you're doing surface mining or underground mining, but there's a lot of work to be able to get at that coal. That all costs money. So you're probably going to want to try to get the cheapest coal first. And at some point, what you're going to have is not a whole lot of cheap coal left. What will be remaining is going to be more expensive to get and if you have a shrinking market for it, it may be the case where you just choose to not go after that coal, just not economically worthwhile. There's other places that are cheaper to get. Montegalia County's had mining since the 19 teens, over 100 years. But if you look at these numbers here, and, and Mon County's fallen off, um, but historically Mon County's been kind of middle of the pack and it's been sort of middle of pack all along. It had, didn't really go through and use up all of its easy coal reserves nearly at the rate of say Boone County where they were mining you know 30 million tons a year. So what we kind of see now is the easy coal has run out in other places because Monongalia County didn't mine as much of its easier coal earlier it still has more left. And that's why we're still seeing a little bit more mining here. So let's go and write an answer for that question. And since we have kind of two questions uh, that are there together, let's just kind of tackle them each on their own in, with their own sentence here. So in 2019, Monongalia County was in the upper middle of the pack of coal mining counties. And then we kind of said that many coal fields counties used to mine much more coal and likely exhausted their reserves of easier to mine coal where Monongalia County has had more moderate production 
and still likely has some easier to produce coal left to mine. Okay, and then let's take a look at 10B. It asks us which county produced the most coal in 1999, and is it the same county that produced the most in 2019? And then the question has, uh, other than depletion of the available coal reserves, why might coal production move to new locations? So let's go look at our data here. And we can actually go and use these little drop down arrows to go and sort things here. So we can see in 1999, Boone County had the most coal. And we said that in 2019, when we were scrolling through earlier, that Marshall County had the most coal. So let's go and answer that part. So in 1999, Boone County produced the most coal. In 2019, it was Marshall County. And there could be you know, a variety of different reasons why production might shift from one area to another. Um, one reason would be the type of coal in a particular area, that maybe there's not as much need for steam coal nowadays due to fewer coal power plants. Um, so coal production might shift more towards areas that have metallurgical coal that's used more for steel or, or vice versa, just depending on the economy. Another reason though, and the one that I'm actually gonna use in my response here, has to do with transportation. Generally speaking, you don't use coal right at the mine itself. While there are some power plants and other things that were designed to go through and operate right at the source of the mine, coal there, um, normally you're going to transport it to some other location where you're going to burn it. And that transportation costs money. You know, whether you're trucking it, putting it by train or by barge, there's expenses with that. And if you have an area that has access to cheaper transportation, like barge tends to be the cheapest, um, you know, there might be kind of a case where things sort of gravitate towards there because it's going to be cheaper to transport that coal than, say, a ton of coal from another location that would have to be trucked to a rail yard and then loaded onto a coal train. So my second part of the answer here is going to be, you know, one reason for moving production to new locations could be access to better or cheaper methods of transporting coal to customers. Go ahead and type and hit enter after we're done typing that and I'm going to save my workbook and at this point we're done with this project. We we'll want to make sure that we go and close out of Excel and then we can go and submit this assignment. If you have any questions, please ask your section instructor or join CS101 Open Lab.